Dr. Greg Daniels. Thank you. And um, we are good friends, which is why I put on shoes today. But I won't put on a tie. I am from San Diego. And, um, and things have changed a lot. And it is a great talk. Thank you for giving me this. But 30 minutes to talk about current therapies in, in metastatic melanoma and what's on the horizon um, is impossible. So I did try to hone it down and riff off of what you've heard already, which is how are we incorporating in pathology, surgery, uh, where are we going, and all that. So hopefully this works. So my disclosures, um, I am in the process of becoming consultant and speaking or to pharmaceutical companies. I'm a local principal investigator currently on these uh, uh, industry-sponsored studies. And then I'm a member of uh, the NCCN and help out on their guidelines. And so what's now? Well, you've heard about it. Um, we have a way of looking inside the cell and finding out what's driving the growth. And this is what we put in quotes as targeted therapies. All the tumors have developed this, whether it's um, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, and melanoma. And so I'm sure Sam is going to become a melanoma doc after this. Um, and those targeted therapies have been a sea change in the management of melanoma because they've taken us from a very nonspecific chemotherapy to now turning the key off in the car. So we can really shut down the growth of a cell with these targeted therapies. The second, if one revolution is not enough, the second revolution has been immune therapies. And we've heard how they're being applied even earlier in the course of disease and trying to raise that cure bar up on those people that have a surgical excision but still have high risk for disease. So that's where we are. And we have this um, sea of therapy choices that patients start off with if they have metastatic or unresectable disease. And we bounce back and forth. And this algorithm and schema has, as you see, evolved over the years and improved the outcomes, as Dr. Hamid just alluded to. It continues to uh, improve. So this is where we are. Uh, we came from chemotherapy, the bottom blue line, when we look at outcomes for patients. And then each iteration of, of moving forward has, has raised the bar slightly. Um, but that slightly has been, you know, we were talking about this is a great time to be an oncologist. Um, my father is an oncologist. It wasn't a great time for him because he had to deal with chemotherapies and very untargeted therapies. While we had some successes, um, things have really evolved. And so we're pushing these curves up. Uh, an example of that, uh, I think this was presented at uh, last year's ASCO and then published in the New England Journal as a longer-term outcome with some of these immune therapies that, that uh, are always in the newspaper and um, yay, Jimmy Carter. Um, so they, they're making substantial progress in the outcomes of patients. However, um, our work's not done, and that's because there are drawbacks to these therapies. There are some toxicities, as I'm sure everybody's been uh, exposed to, because uh, we get into almost 100%, whether it's fatigue or itching or changes in your, your bowel. And that's, you know, these therapies still, while they're targeted and trying to go after very specific things, they're actually, they're in our body. And so they'll, they'll impact us in some of the ways that we've already heard about. The other problem, um, as Dr. Hamid was just alluding to, is we don't have all the answers yet. So we, we've pushed the bars up, but you know, this is where we're at. We, we, we're not at our goal, and our goal is no cancer. That's really our goal. Um, but in the current state, we want to cure cancer. Um, and so, oh, there we are. So what's next? So I'm going to go over this now. I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> at, Omid gave me this slide. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, I think it's actually a couple years old now. And, uh, you'll see that this is just looking at the aspect of PD-1 blockade or immune therapy and melanoma and other tumor types, and then the plus that we've heard about, that you know, it looks like we need something more a lot of times to, to get that patient across the finish line. And so I, I'm not going to take that approach. What I'm going to do is look at um, what we're using now, 
our understandings of that. And as Sam was alluding to, um, our technology has really um, gone forward from the time where we looked under a microscope and said, oh, histiocytes are present, to now, what the heck are those? And those are subsets of immune cells and the interactions that are going on, and they're giving us insights into how the disease process is evolving. And that's allowed us to look at novel agents and develop novel things um, to get through that cure. And what I would hope someday is to get to that prevention state. So we're learning all about cancer and evolution of cancer, that should be able to apply it back to the graph that was shown in the beginning, which is unfortunately the incidence of melanoma continues to go up year after year despite our good efforts of getting the word out. Thank you for coming today, by the way. Get the word out. So, but um, I think we're going to gain some insights into prevention from this. The second uh, one I alluded to was, well, it would be nice to have cancer treatment and not end up in the hospital. Um, things like that, so decreased toxicity is the other theme. So how do we identify patients? This is uh, Georgina Long's, uh, I stole it from her, and most of the slides I stole from other people too. Um, so in Dr. Long's uh, analysis, she looked back at targeted therapies in a group of patients, and just clinically, so simple tests, oh, you look good, oh, you look less well, um, LDH, a simple blood test, how many sites of disease, and could divide up the patients. And so for a targeted therapy, as again Sam was alluding to, everybody had the right gene, everybody should have responded about the same, but they didn't. So we can, we can just see that clinically, who's gonna do a little bit better or not, not as well, um, by just making some clinical assumptions. But we can do better than that. And so here's, the, I'm gonna go through a series of slides and, and tell you kind of where the field's going. So here's what an oncologist does. Oh, we have something that works. We have something that works. Let's just put them together. Right. So we have stuff that works, targeted therapies, and we have stuff that works, immune therapies. So we're just going to put them together. Um, this is um, an early phase trial that's getting going. Hopefully we'll hear some more uh, results from it. But uh, Dr. Dumer, he's uh, in Switzerland, presented this at uh, Society of Immune Therapy of Cancer. And what he's combining are um, the PD-1 blockade with the targeted therapies or for BRAF. And when you do that, you, you do get some toxicities, like 100% of the patients um, will experience some toxicity, but you also get some fairly decent responses out of there. But I think we can do better than this um, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, this is outstanding work, uh, really promising, very early, um, a little bit toxic, and what are we learning from this? And what we're learning is that through clinical trials in the Angeles Clinic and great work of Dr. Hamid, who's on this publication and sent me some of these slides, is same thing. We're taking some immune therapy and targeted therapy, but we're looking hard at the pathology and noticing that when we expose patients to some of these targeted therapies, they change the way the tumor looks. So looks to us, um, we can see different colors on the slide, but it also looks different to the body where we're getting with a targeted therapy, some infiltration of immune cells, we're getting some different expressions going on. Well, that's interesting. I just said that there's two kind of themes of, of treatment that we're doing. There's targeted therapies and immune therapies, but it's probably not true, right? Um, these are all interacting in our body, and so that targeted therapies is an immune therapy, and an immune therapy is a targeted therapy because those internal workings of the cell actually change how your body sees it. So now that we have that understanding, we can be more rational about combining it in, in patients so that um, here's some more changes that he sees, infiltration of the tumor with T cells that then you can unleash with your uh, PD-1 therapy. So, the field's evolving into trying to get a grasp on all these variables. Um, Dr. Rebus over at UCLA has been a big uh, proponent of trying to just get this information out in an understandable way that, uh, yeah, for immune therapies to work, the immune system has to see the tumor, so that's foreignness. Sorry, my pointer's dead, I think, um, but that's the, the top part of this diagram. Um, it has to be sensitive to the immune therapies. 
has to have all sorts of different um, determinants in the tumor to make it susceptible. Well, who's different from the next person in this room? Right? You know, we're all different, and so all tumors are different. And, and so with the technology, we're able to interrogate this difference and figure out where the problems are uh, to target our therapies. And so using this um, idea, you can think about a tumor as having, oh, well, maybe they just, they, they're inflamed, but they just got to get that next step. So that next step in this case is the PD-1. Or maybe they just don't have any inflammation in there because they're not attracting the immune system. So then we get into what Dr. Esner was saying and injecting in a, a virus in there to really bring in the immune system. So we're trying to be a little more rational about all this. Um, so I'll present kind of on that theme now some of these newer therapies. So we heard about interferon. It's a medication that was used to help prevent melanoma from coming back. But it's also the central, one of the central kind of power punches of the immune system. So a T cell will make interferon, and it'll kill the cancer directly. It, it causes a cascade of mechanisms to happen. But it also, in the yin and yang of biology, turns itself down. And so it has some negative effects in, in the tumor microenvironment. So we need to get a handle on this dynamic interaction that's going on. And here, Dr. Rebus again, stealing some of his work, uh, went through and with a expression uh, test. And this was, uh, I think, the real advancement forward was that you can do this now on a very small biopsy. You can even do it on archival tissue, and you can get these quantitative values, uh, which are dots on a graph, um, that help us characterize uh, patients' tumors uh, as to how inflamed they are and what that inflammation really means. And so in this case, he used a signature that he developed to help predict whether they responded or not responded to an immune therapy. Interestingly, his signature was positive. You needed that signature there, but it wasn't enough. Um, so there are still patients down at the bottom of the curve that had the signature that didn't respond. And so what's going on with those? So we need more work there. And this is how we're doing it. Um, and this concept has been around for a little while. Dr. Chen published this. And um, what the model is, is a patient will come in and will personalize the approach, right? Um, and right now, we have information on how to direct PD-1 therapy, again, this immune-based immune, immune treatment. Um, but clinical trials ongoing, and again, work at the Angelus, um, will throw in all these other agents in hopefully a rational way so that everybody's not exposed to the same stuff and the chance of, of a good outcome starts to go up. So what are the tools that we're getting to address the tumor microenvironment? Some of the injectables have been alluded to. I'll highlight a few uh, current studies. So Oncosec is a, a company actually down in San Diego. And uh, as was alluded to, this was the electroporation device. And they all have the same um, kind of theme here. You inject something into the tumor, you're trying to change that environment that's, that's going on in there from a non-recognized one or whatever the defect is. In this case, they inject an interleukin-12 plasmid. Interleukin-12 itself is a pretty uh, difficult drug to tolerate. Small doses of it make you feel like the flu. Uh, a little bit larger doses make you go to the hospital. So. We have, a, we have to have a way of controlling it, and, and what um, Dr. Dowd did up at UCSF was to develop this way of delivering it on a plasmid, then it's electroporated into local cells, and you get a small amount of this interleukin-12 expressed in the tumor, and that changes how the body sees it. And so they've gone through a series of um, studies looking at single agent, what are the, the changes that happen after you inject in this plasmid, that circle. Uh, graph there, and we see that uh, it can cause other cells to come into the tumor microenvironment and changing the, the expression in those cells from quiescent, complacent, and actually promoting tumor growth to, hey, I'm kind of angry. Something's woken me up, and I want to go kill somebody. So in the technologies that we have, we can see that kind of change here with um, you inject in the the DNA electroporated in, and we've seen the right, what we consider the right signature starting to come up here, which is 
primed for anti-tumor response. So as they went through their series of studies, they said, well, everybody's um, curing melanoma with PD-1. Well, there's a group that would be expected not to respond to PD-1. Why don't we focus our efforts there? So they enriched their population for people that they would think would not respond to uh, PD-1 therapy. And lo and behold, uh, it kind of worked. So it's encouraging, um, but we always need to to do more and better. And so in this case, uh, they're re revamping their study, not as a predictor who won't respond, but actually taking those patients who won't respond, um, who are getting current therapies and are refractory to them, and then trying to change that tumor microenvironment. So Lion, which is no longer Lion, it's uh, IOVANCE, um, but that's okay, um, is taking another approach. Um, and that is, well, if in the tumor, um, and this was work pioneered by Rosenberg and the NCI, and their, it's, it's cell therapy that's going on at other institutions, including Cedars and the Angelus Clinic. But uh, what Lyon's doing, or IOVANCE, is trying to make it so that everybody can do it. And so do it is take the cells that's in the tumor, those immune cells that should be doing the right job, but they're not, take them out of the body, re-educate them in some way, and give them back to the patient to go and then do the right thing of kill the tumor. So that's adoptive cell therapy. So you take the tumor out, you take the immune cells from that tumor, and then you put them back in the body. Um, it's complicated, okay? Um, this is just a schematic that makes it look simple, but it's complicated. Um, and so you have to have an institution like Cedars and uh, major academic centers to run these things right now, um, whereas you you know, they trivialize that they have a little airplane flying off and, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for this. Um, but it works. Uh, you can, you can re-educate those immune cells you can, that were sitting there helping the tumor grow before and now help get rid of the tumor. And so, as uh, was alluded to, these waterfall plots, you want to be on the underside of a waterfall plot. You want your tumor to shrink, which is what that represents. Um, so we call that TIL 1.0. Um, where you take a tumor out, maybe you can see some specificity for the uh, tumor in there, but it's a uh, pretty bulky technology, and it's called bulk tills. Um, and, but these cells, what you're getting out and growing, they're not very well characterized. They may not work that great. You know, can we do better? So here's an attempt to do better. Um, and as alluded to, there's these mutations floating around. They kind of make a tumor look um, recognizable by your immune system. And so some of those mutations we call neoantigens. These are just the mutations that happened in the tumor. They're new, neo. And the antigen part is recognized by the immune system. Sounds easy. It's not. Uh, you have to, to find those neoantigens, you have to have a biopsy, you have to do sequencing, you have to do some computer algorithms that predict based on that, we all raised our hand of being different, based on our differences that we have in our own immune system, to come out with your antigenic mutinome. You know, what makes your tumor different than the next person's tumor? And that's what we want our cells to recognize. Because if we only recognize those differences in the tumor, then hopefully we can lower that toxicity bar, right? And we can raise that benefit bar. So we call that TIL 2.0. And uh, here we're sorting the cells based on their specificity um, to get it in. There's still obviously room for improvement. This is a, an amazingly complicated process. And um, involved in this is something called interleukin-2 or uh, bolus IL-2. And, um, so patients are in the hospital when they're getting these treatments um, and cells infused back into them. So we can do better on that. Um, in the sense that this is another company I'll just highlight, um, Nectar, I think it's up in the Bay Area, and they have interleukin-2. Well, you don't see interleukin-2 on there. You see all sorts of words that I can't say. But uh, Nectar 214 is interleukin-2 that's been pegylated. This is a process where you can change how a drug uh, is cleared in the body or maybe interacts with other things. And so with nectar, with this 
interleukin-2, which we always knew was a very powerful molecule for the immune system. It was just a little too powerful because people ended up in the ICU. Um, so they can take their engineered interleukin-2 with this pegylation and show that it does all the good of interleukin-2 of expanding T cells and making them anti-tumorish uh, without the bad, uh, which is some of the toxicities or lowering the toxicities and <laughs> improving the types of cells that it targets. And so they went through their mouse studies showing that they're doing that. They went through some early clinical trials showing that, um, yes, they are enhancing the number of uh, T cells at the tumor site. And I'll just highlight some of the early uh, melanoma stuff. And at ASCO this year, uh, we're hopefully going to see some more data from interleukin-2 as a partner for uh, immune therapies. And the nice thing there is, again, going back to our cell therapies, that's been a major roadblock there. So can't we take a kinder and gentler interleukin-2 and maybe integrate it into our cell therapies and bring it out of the hospital to an outpatient setting? For example. So lots of stuff on the future. And all that is coming from our understandings. Again, I'm going to steal something from Dr. Rebus, um, looking at trying to understand what's going on in the microenvironment is key and how we're applying our tools and how we're developing new tools to try to get there. And so here's his schema. But also, he constantly reminds us that um, we think we're so smart, uh, but we are not. Um, and while I said, oh, well, targeted therapies and immune therapies may be just a continuum of the same thing, that leads to some consequences too. And, and he highlighted a surprise for the field, which is surprise, when you do targeted therapies, you may be impacting your response rates for immune therapies. And so the dynamics that are going on in our treatments need to be taken into account. So we do need biopsies. We do need to watch that dynamic change over time because timing is going to be important in all this as well. So with that, um, I'll also um, show you that uh, we're going towards that personalized approach. Um, I hope you appreciate some of the technology that needs to be applied in, in getting there and uh, the work that everybody's doing to get there. We're really trying, guys. We are uh, going to be on chemotherapy. And uh, with that, I'll just uh, thank AIM uh, for putting this on and, of course, Dr. Hamid for always a, a great... Uh, a great show, thank you. And uh, we'll take questions on the panel, so thank you.